community is increasingly looking at what it can and needs to do. How can we ensure water availability, quality, management and sustainability in the times of global unpredictability and uncertainty? These questions are at the core of IHE Delft's sixth international symposium on knowledge and capacity development, from capacity development to implementation science. We are creating a platform where around 1,000 conference participants can meet online to discuss how to remove barriers to water capacity, manage institutional change, and use big data in decision making. In a mix of webinars, plenaries, chat rooms, and video conferencing, we'll be bringing together scholars, decision makers, and practitioners to debate the current and future role of capacity development in water policy, practice, and education. The symposium will be a catalyst in building commitment among participants that will lead to future action and collaboration. A key focus will be the potential for implementation science in developing future water capacity. We look forward to working together with you and building the future of water. Patricio, are we ready then? Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to some of you. Uh, welcome to this um, topic on collaboration of um, on partnerships, which is part of track six on um, capacity development to knowledge acceleration and sharing as part of this year's IHE symposium. My name is Damian Indig. I work for CAPNET UNDP and together with uh, my colleagues, Jasmina Rice Alfeni and uh, Patricio Roller Passos, also from CAPNET UNDP. We welcome you to uh, this session. Um, I will be moderating the session today. Uh, Jasmina will be the rapporteur preparing um, a, a report with your recommendations and inputs, we will, which will be part of the overall recommendations of this uh, track six. Uh, to form part of the Delft agenda. And Patricio is also helping us with uh, technical support and also uh, reading your, um, your comments in the, in the chat window. We have this uh, morning the opportunity to hear from four experienced professionals sharing their views and recommendation on partnerships for water knowledge. Um, we all agree on the value of capacity development and we all recognize the complexity of water management and there comes uh, partnerships as an inter interesting uh, response and, and strategy but the idea of this session today is to explore how far are we doing with getting the best out of partnerships and especially we would like to hear from our guest speakers and from you your recommendations leading the way forward. We know there is a lot yet to be done and there is a very high potential to achieve. So the idea mainly is to arrive to very concrete recommendations for actions, which we could suggest to the Delft agenda. The session this morning begins with uh, three presentations by uh, our speakers. Each speaker will have 15 minutes and then we will have another five minutes uh, per round for, for questions. Um, as, as you know, participants, uh, we, uh, we cannot give you the possibility to, to speak, uh, but we invite you to share as many comments and questions as you wish on the chat window, and we will uh, read them so uh, to, to share them with everybody and also to give the speakers the opportunity to reply. Please keep that in mind and, and please uh, send your questions as, as you want, and we will follow them. Um, we will start first with the presentation of um, Andrea, then Gordon, and then Indica and Florencia. I will introduce each one of them in, in a minute. And after this first uh, part of, of the session with the um, presentations, we will move into a second part, which is an invitation for an interactive conversation around different issues on, on partnerships. 
this conversation will be structured in three different moments. I will introduce each one of the of the moments, and the idea is also to start a nice sharing of experiences and thoughts from everybody. We expect that the this session overall could last uh, one and a half hours, uh, more or less, depending on the on the level of interaction we receive from all. So, after this uh, short introduction, let me uh, welcome Andrea Beck. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. In the summer of 2018, she attended a short course on partnerships for water supply and sanitation at IHE Delft. Her dissertation research looks at water operator partnerships in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa trying to understand the elements that lead to effective and sustainable capacity development between water operators. For this research, she did fieldwork in the Netherlands and Malawi, and she's going to share now with all of us her findings. So, Andrea, if you want, please. Thanks so much for, um, for the introduction. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully that will... Hopefully you can all see it. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks so much again. And um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening. Thanks so much for having me in this session. Um, my presentation um, today is titled Capacity Development and the Pitfalls of Professionalization in Water Operator Partnerships. Um, this research I'm going to present draws on my larger dissertation project, which looks at so-called water operator partnerships and ways of making these partnerships more sustainable and effective. Um, so to start, um, I'm going to give a little bit of background information about water operator partnerships, or WAPs, um, as they are called for short. Um, so WAPs can be defined as peer-to-peer -peer partnerships between water operators. Um, they were first proposed um, back in 2006 by a UN advisory board, um, and they were envisioned as a mechanism to speed up um, progress towards the Millennium Development Goal water, um, on water and sanitation at the time. Um, since um, they were first proposed, WAPs have been institutionalized under the UN. Um, so there is now a global multi-stakeholder alliance called GWOPA, which is part of UN Habitat. Um, there are also um, a number of regional and national platforms um, promoting WAPs, and there have been conferences and also several case studies have been completed. Um, some of this led by researchers affiliated with a project called BWAP that's actually based at the IEG. Uh, um, according to a UN database, several hundred WAPs have been done to date. Um, this is actually not that much given how many um, water operators there are in the world and how many operators could benefit from support. Um, but it still indicates that the WAP idea has gained traction. Um, so just to summarize sort of the defining um, features of WAPs. Um, so WAPs are peer-to-peer -peer partnerships, um, meaning that um, water operators will get the opportunity to learn from colleagues facing similar challenges. So they WAPs sort of bring together professionals from um, water utilities to really help um, and support each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Um, the partnerships are supposed to be done on a not-for-profit basis. Um, and the goal is really to build and strengthen capacity rather than sort of um, supplant capacity or bring in sort of private consultants. So the idea is really to build um, capacity mainly in the public sector. Um, and finally, the partnerships are supposed to lead to performance improvements that mainly benefit the poor. Um, so in my research, I'm, um, I've studied one WAP in detail. Um, in this partnership, um, Wittens Avidis International, or VAI, of the Netherlands uh, served as the mentor, and the Lelongwe Water Board of Malawi was the mentee. Um, VAI is a public limited company that's based in Utrecht, um, and it brings together five Dutch drinking water companies. And the Lelongwe Water Board is the water utility serving the capital city of Malawi. The WAP lasted from 2015 to 2019, so it was four years um, of, of sort of partnering activities. Um, and as part of my dissertation research, I interviewed 
the actors involved in this partnership, both in the Netherlands and in Malawi. And what I found is that the WAP um, was strongly focused on the issue of non-revenue water reduction. So non-revenue water is a technical concept that um, refers to water losses. So for example, water loss to tank overflows or leakages or unauthorized consumption. Um, so I learned that um, non-revenue water is currently the main challenge facing the longer water board and actually also um, many other utilities in sub-Saharan Africa and in the global south generally. Um, and so um, at the Lilongwe Water Board, non-revenue water has, consist has been um, consistently quite high, so between 35 and 38 percent of water production. And so to, to reduce um, the water losses, the Water Board has formulated a number of strategic documents that it now seeks to implement with the help of utility partners. Um, so one thing I found in my interviews and document analysis is that VI increasingly strives to professionalize its partnerships. So what this involves is on, uh, an orientation towards delivering results and results not just in terms of individual learning, but especially in terms of improving organizational capacity and performance. And sort of this progress or these performance improvements are supposed to be measured um, by key performance indicators or KPIs. Um, KPIs are quantitative performance indicators that are um, used in the water sector to sort of compare and assess utility performance. Um, so, for example, non-revenue water would be an example of one key performance indicator or KPI. Um, um, Andrea, sorry, it's Damien here. May I yes. interrupt you for a second? You know, we are not watching you, your presentation very well. It's too zoomed. Uh, and um, oh. Sorry about so, that. So what maybe, I, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe you can show it like this, and, yeah. and perhaps just make it bigger on on that um, on that Absolutely. side, uh, as bigger as possible, and yes. uh, so everybody can can see it. And uh, I think that's that's better. And by the way, by the end of the session, I will um, share in the chat window the link where all the the presentations by Andrea, Gordon, and and Indica are already uploaded in, in the platform. So you can all watch them later if, if you want. So sorry for the interruption, Andrea, please go ahead. Perfect, thanks so much for letting me know. So I hope it's, um, it's the visibility is better now. Um, okay, so uh, going back into um, sort of key performance indicators. Um, so that's, that's one um, way in which VI try, tries to professionalize its partnership. So by using quantitative performance measurements to really prove um, the performance achievements that have been um, sort of um, implemented. So another aspect of professionalization is a lot of advanced planning in terms of um, sort of scheduling short-term missions of Dutch experts traveling to partner utilities in the global south. Um, so in the partnership with um, the Lilongwe Water Board in Malawi, the most important um, key performance indicator as I said, was non-revenue water. So the goal was to reduce non-revenue water to 25%. Um, and this sort of achieving this goal was tied to monetary rewards for VI. The idea of performance compensation was actually carried over from a service contract that had taken place before the WAP, so from 2009 to 2014. Um, so my research shows that this fixation on the NRW target had a number of implications for capacity development in the partnership. So um, my findings here actually echo previous research by Maria Pasquale and colleagues who found that the use of KPIs in capacity development um, can lead to frustration related to smaller successes being overlooked. Um, and so Pasquale and colleagues called for the adoption of alternative evaluation frameworks. Um, that also pay attention to intangible um, gains and progress over time. So for instance, um, as shown in this figure, which is um, from their article, so also paying attention to the to this satisfaction of the partners and to relational capacity being built rather than jumping straight to um, KPI changes, which really take, um, might take some time to materialize. Um, so my case study, um, suggests that 
such alternative results frameworks have still not been adopted. So this idea of measuring results in different ways has been around for some time. But um, when I when I went to the long way, I realized or looked at this partnership in detail, I saw that such frameworks have still not been um, adopted widely. Um, so the obsession with NLW reduction in the partnership had a number of implications for learning and capacity development. So it led to relational damage between the partners due to the high performance pressure. And it also led to a sort of tunnel vision on the part of the Vi team in the long way, which increasingly closed itself off from local realities and alternative ways of working, mainly because they were incredibly pressured to achieve the successes in um, non-revenue water reduction. So a change in that particular KPI. Um, so moving on to some lessons learned. Um, my research indicates that the use of um, KPIs and capacity development partnerships on the one hand aligns well with donor calls for quantitatively measuring the effectiveness of WAPs and thereby can increase the attractiveness of WAPs in the eyes of donors. Um, but also um, the use of KPIs can prioritize quantitative metrics and donor conditions over mentee needs and perspectives and thereby risks undermining learning and capacity development in WAPs. Um, so finally, here are my recommendations for action. Um, first, I recommend that mentors like VI should move away from a narrow focus on KPIs. Um, instead, the partners and the Global Alliance GWOPA should um, champion alternative evaluation framework for capacity development partnerships. Um, so as I was um, sort of was uh, indicating earlier, um, such frameworks have been suggested by various scholars. So ideas are around, but it seems like these frameworks have not been um, implemented so far. And one reason for this seems to be that donors have not endorsed them. Um, instead, donors seem to be sticking to an approach that calls for measurable results and proof of effectiveness. Although there is um, evidence that this is um, actually counterproductive to capacity um, development. And my case study um, once again underscores this. Um, so I suggest that we need to look beyond the water operators themselves and also work with donors as key actors to increase the acceptance and implementation of alternative evaluation frameworks in, the, in capacity development partnerships. Um, so here are a couple of um, sort of the references I used in this presentation. Um, and uh, so thanks so much for listening to my findings and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thanks very much, Andrea. Just very clear, very interesting. I, I have some questions on, on my own already, but I would like to invite uh, our guests uh, participants if they have any questions. Um, so we have a question from uh, Lim. Uh, good to sharing Malawi's experience. Malaysia's uh, NRW, it's also th about 35%. Do you know how much it would cost just to reduce NRW by 1% in the case of Malawi? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so what I learned in Malawi is that um, even reducing NRW by 1% is a really tough task. Um, and so reducing it by 10% as they had um, sort of set themselves as an objective um, is really very difficult. Um, so I don't know exactly how much it would cost actually to bring it down by 1% so in monetary terms. Um, but I know that it involves like a lot of um, sort of action on different fronts. So they would need to tackle um, commercial losses and physical losses at the same time. Um, and it's very hard even to know, um, at least for the, the water board had no exact sort of grasp of how much was, of the NRW was caused by physical versus commercial losses. Um, so even partitioning that out and sort of measuring what, what the biggest challenge is um, was quite difficult also because the infrastructure is in a different is in different conditions across the city. Um, so I don't know exactly in monetary terms, but it is certainly a tough task that um, sort of requires a lot of coordination across different 
um, areas um, of water losses. Okay, thank you. Um, any other question from our participants? Well, then I have a question. Um, Andrea, you mentioned in, in the end um, the idea of uh, alternative uh, frameworks and how difficult it is sort of to think out of, out of the box and, and, and move ahead with some uh, innovations in, in this field. Um, so I'm going to be very concrete. Suppose that we present next week the recommendations from the sessions. These recommendations go into the Delft agenda, which I assume it will be read by a number of uh, donors who want to hear on very concrete recommendations. So which one or maybe two alternative uh, frameworks would you suggest uh, to be included in this, in this document as something which you think should be highly considered and um, let's say to 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 be um, uh, to be kind with with the donors. Uh, let's say to be tested or to be piloted. Where would you suggest? Let's say okay. I, I'm sure that if we pilot this, we will get good results. So what would that be? How would that work? Um, yeah, that's also um, a, a a great question um, that um, sort of has um, come up in my own thinking. Um, a lot as I was sort of formulating these recommendations. Um, there is actually research going on at the IHE um, in this project called BWAP that I sort of briefly mentioned earlier. And the framework I showed is um, has been developed by uh, Maria Pasquale, who um, used to work for the IHE and now shifted to, um, or is now working for um, GWOPA. And um, she has done, um, sort of invested a lot of thinking and research um, in how such a framework could look like. And sort of the, the figure I presented sort of lies out that um, framework that she developed. And I think that could really be one approach to um, sort of pilot in, in more partnerships. And okay. I'm happy to share sort of yeah. the, the reference to that article that sort of really describes it in more detail. Okay, that's great. And finally, you mentioned also at the beginning that the, the number of WAPs it's uh, somehow um, low. Um, mm -hmm. So suppose that um, you were having a conversation with, with someone who's a, a decision making uh, maker at an utility and uh, this person, uh, she or he is telling you, well, we are so busy with our problems, uh, running the utility is so complicated and the economy and the country and all the challenges. So we don't really have time for partnerships because we are really covered with, with our own problems. So what would you tell these persons about um, why do you recommend to, to enter into this kind of uh, partnership uh, agreements? Um, I think the, the sort of time pressure and lots of tasks to handle at the same time is, is really a common challenge for many utilities. Um, but I would still say that sort of working with a partner, especially a partner from another utility, perhaps even from the same context, let's say um, partnering with a utility from Southern Africa or from the region that is really facing the same challenges, it can actually make finding solutions a lot easier. So instead of being in your own set of silo or box and trying to find solutions and thinking up innovative approaches, it can really help sort of seeing in practice what others are doing to tackle the same challenge. So it might be a bit of a time investment at first, but then it can really speed up innovation because it's from what I've heard from utility partners um, working with others, it's really rewarding and can really like foster this out of the box um, thinking and then also really getting targeted advice from utilities facing the same challenges. So even if it's a time investment at first, it can really speed up um, action and innovation in the process. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And I'm just going to mention one more, but we will keep this one for uh, later in the session when we talk about these different moments. Um, you talked about, uh, I'm quoting, measurable results. And of course, that's, uh, that's the, the issue which everybody wants to see in terms of partnerships and capacity development, sort of a magic being done. 
So later on in, in the session, I'd like to um, come back to this one and, and, and talk about these indicators that uh, we are all sort of uh, demanded over and over. And, and what can we discuss about uh, this uh, measurable results? I think it's a, it's a key issue. Um, so thanks again, Andrea. Uh, let's move into our second presentation. Now in, in, in this uh, session on, on, on collaborating in partners, partnerships, you will see that we have different kinds of arrangements. So it's a good to, to experience um, these different uh, approaches, per perspectives and, and, and methods in which people col are collaborating in water knowledge. So I'm going to move now into our second uh, speaker today, uh, which is uh, Gordon Coop. Uh, he's an IHE uh, alumni, and he will present about the magic of partnerships to overcome barriers and bring innovative solutions. Uh, let me briefly introduce you to, to Gordon. Uh, he followed a bachelor degree in biology and environmental studies Trent University in Canada in 1978. Then he completed the environmental science and technology course at IHE in 1981. Gordon then carried out wastewater treatment in research and development and scientific editing for the Canadian Research Council for three years. And then in 1987, he completed a PhD in fish biology in France, which was followed by a postdoc on riverine fishes in England, where Gordon lectured at the University of Hertfordshire for 10 years. In 2002, Gordon joined CFAS, where as principal scientist, he leads research in non-native aquatic species risk analysis and mentors early career scientists. And he's going to present us now the um, partnership and the, the ongoing uh, life learning experience network he has with his uh, IHE uh, alumni. So Gordon, welcome and uh, all to you now. Okay, so I have to share my screen. Can you see it? It's, it's coming, but we are not seeing your uh, presentation yet. Here there we go. Is. Yeah. Can can you see everything on this on the slide? Yes, it's it's working well, and uh, if not, I, I will let you know. Okay, great. So greetings to everyone. Uh, this is an interesting shift going from an early career scientist to a, a late career, almost end of career scientist. Uh, I'm one of twenty five participants who. Uh, took the environmental science and technology course in, uh, at the IET in Delft. And today's talk is about a higher ed education institution, which is the IET, and a postdoc training course, the EST, uh, as we refer to it, and how this brought together people from various parts of the world and resulted in the creation of a network that has promoted capacity building and career development in the water sector for over 40 years. Not only uh, helping each other in our careers, but also in the people, the percolation, if you will, of our career building, our capacity building to people we work with and our students. And on this slide, you see a picture of us at the end of our course in 1981 on the left, uh, we held a reunion at an earlier um, symposium of, of this same title um, about 20 years ago, and it was our 20-year reunion, and so it is almost 40 years come next year. Um, <clears throat> and in the bottom right-hand corner, you see uh, uh, the Skype meeting that we had uh, a few weeks ago. We have them every Sunday and, and meet up and discuss, um, and I would like to thank all of the past, uh, what I mean to say, all of the members of my class, um, some are still with us, thankfully. Others, unfortunately, have passed away. And I would like to thank all of those from their past contributions and also, in particular, to the contributions to this talk. So what is the role of higher education in capacity building in today's network society? Well, some of the key elements are 
the training and understanding of, of key concepts. And this is something that the IEG gave to us. <clears throat> we also need to develop uh, transferable skills. Uh, when you have your training, you have your first job uh, experience, you will acquire some skills and those skills uh, on the next task that you have can very well come into, into good use, even if that new task is, is quite different from, from previous tasks that you had. Essential amongst these skills is, is networking. Um, personally, uh, networking has been an extremely key part of my uh, career, and uh, it's through the help of my <clears throat> colleagues that um, uh, my career has progressed as it has. Another very important aspect, <clears throat> which wasn't spoken about so much back in the 80s, but it was obvious to us because we were many participants from many parts of the world, as I used to say, 25 participants and 19 kinds of English. And diversity and inclusion in the workplace is in a very important aspect. And we learned an awful lot about um, the uh, need to understand each other's cultures in working together in group work, which would uh, enhance our productivity and our creativity. And also, um, this facilitates network society to find solutions for the water sector, which is increasingly uh, complex and requires um, greater uh, um, creativity. <clears throat> so three networking themes we're going to look at today. Uh, academic career development, document knowledge exchange, and scientific cooperation and research uh, exchanges. And uh, what we're going to do is look at some of the examples of uh, how our, our EST network was helping each other. Uh, my bits are partially put in gray because we're going to use me as a case study later. But if we look here under career and academic development, uh, our colleague Rada Oldina from uh, Sarajevo has been helping colleagues with their further training needs, uh, in particular Maria in Argentina uh, during um, uh, the last uh, uh, few decades. Um, if we look on the bottom left hand corner, Okay, seems that uh, we have lost uh, Gordon. Let's wait a couple of minutes. Usually, these things tend to um, solve. We did take it is a connection issue. So he might uh, leave the session and join again. I okay. think that would be the best. Meanwhile, I, I will share with you what will happen afterwards. Well, first, we will hear from um, my colleagues from, from Cabinet, Indica Gunawardana. Oh, there he is. Gunna. Sorry? Um, Gordon, we we lost you. I don't know if you realized, but we lost you for um for like uh, one minute. So um, right. take it from from there, please. Uh, so uh, previous slide, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. On on that one, yeah. Right here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so is it back again? Yes, perfect. Lovely. Okay, so um, I'll try to summarize this quickly. Um, we have various examples here of, of how colleagues have helped each other um, in, in each other's academic and career development. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, Rada from Sarajevo has helped colleagues throughout uh, the, the last uh, few decades in, in their uh, further training. Uh, Eduardo and Alvaro worked together to develop the Bolivia-Peru University Exchange Framework. Um, Bela in Hungary uh, was very important in inspiring my career direction and he introduced me to a number of key scientists. 
overall in Bolivia, uh, organized visits to um, uh, Bolivia for Mr. E from South Korea and uh, co-hosted meetings with Eduardo. Um, Daksha in India has been very supportive of network colleagues in various uh, academic exchanges, which we'll discuss a bit later. Um, if we look on the left-hand side, um, Jacob and George in Ghana were exchanging strategic water sector assessments. Uh, George is still with us, thankfully. Unfortunately, uh, Jacob has uh, passed away uh, in, in a flood some years back and, and much beloved member of our class. In Indonesia, Bakhtiar was um, helping Mr. E from South Korea with in, uh, various uh, publications on aquatic science in, in Indonesia. Um, and uh, Daksha was passing on documentation and information to, to colleagues from, from India. Um, I was uh, uh, circulating some information I had when I worked for the Canadian government on various types of pollution. Um, George and Jacob's exchanges also included um, climate change impact assessment. And um, Bela was a key person in providing water resource documentation to a number of us, in particular, Dr. Radha and myself. If we look at the uh, exchanges that took place in terms of scientific cooperation and research exchange, uh, we look in the bottom right hand corner. I mentioned that uh, Daksha had been uh, important in passing on information. Well, she and Bela were successful in, in um, acquiring funding in a Hund India Hungarian um, research exchange that was uh, uh, adapting water quality assessment protocols that Bela was working with uh, for use in India. Um, uh, Moving upwards, we have Mr. E, who was hosting Bela for visits to sample in, in uh, South Korean streams. Uh, Bela hosted several of my visits to Hungary, to the Danube River and other wetland areas. Um, uh, Bakhtiar and E were collaborating on marine, uh, Pacific marine ecology issues. Um, Alvaro and Eduardo from Peru and Bolivia were um, co-hosting meetings on uh, environmental development, uh, environmental management for development. And currently, Alvaro and I are in the process of adapting a fish game, which I, uh, uh, I adapted from something else during my university career for group work in, in communicating uh, ecology uh, concepts to, to students, and we're in the process of adapting this for Bolivian uh, science courses. Now, uh, a case study is usually a, a, a simple way of passing on um, how one has uh, 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 benefited, if you will, in, in the case of career development. Um, and as I mentioned, Bela was extremely important. He was really um, enthusiastic about anything that was aquatic uh, during our course in, in Delft. And I, I attached myself to, to fish ecology as being the area that I wanted to follow. And one of our professors, uh, the professor uh, Holtermann, um, uh, who taught us limnology, he arranged for me to have a summer internship in France and then introduced me to the, the director of the laboratory uh, in Lyon, the Fish Ecology Lab, and uh, a PhD position was opened up for me there. When I was there, um, I heard from our, one of our colleagues, uh, classmates from, from uh, Indonesia, Rahimullah, and he had won a grant to study a PhD in France as part of a uh, French-Indonesia exchange. Um, and he contacted me because he was having difficulty. He, is, he said that, okay, I've had one year of French training here in, in Macron, but uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not communicating well enough with, with the professors. I've had someone already reject me for um, a request to come and work with them. And his, one of his choices was at the university in Lyon. And I, I went around and spoke to this professor and explained the situation. And Joachim Ula ended up coming to Lyon and joining me there and completed his PhD successfully. And he was working in a very interesting area using uh, solar energy and catalysts to break down um, pollutants uh, as part of a, a water treatment uh, process. 
Um, and during that time, Bela wanted to come to the University of Lyon and see what kind of research they were doing on rivers, which is he's working on the Danube in, in, in Hungary. And I was able to or help him and organize a, a trip to Lyon with the funding and everything else. After my PhD, I ended up in England for a postdoc and, uh, and then uh, my lectureship at the university, which, which was mentioned at the introduction. And Bela provided me with a lot of uh, key wetland literature, which I was able to use in, in, in my lectures. Um, but also, in addition to my own field trips to, to Hungary, um, he was able to organize um, what we call work placements, one year research internships. He would either supervise the students himself in his lab in hydrobiology, or he would arrange uh, for them to work in, in the labs of, of, of other colleagues of his in Hungary. Um, very important because some of these people carried on in, in their careers uh, working in, in wetland restoration and areas like that. Um, back in England, I did my best to help Radha when she moved to England to, to, to take up jobs with, with job interviews and so on. Alvaro came from Bolivia to do his master's degree in, at Leeds, and so he was hosted in my home. I helped him however I could. Um, also, during his PhD back in Bolivia, he needed some documentation, and I would send to them. And Rada is living part-time in England now, part-time in Sarajevo, and we meet up quite frequently. And whenever one of our uh, classmates would come to England, we would meet up in, in London. And on several occasions, I would come over to the IHE, um, and and whilst there, I would visit one of our strongest supporters, uh, one of our lecturers in environmental microbiology in our course, uh, uh, Hubert Meisters. Um, and uh, uh, the last time I was there, in fact, was um, uh, back in um, uh, 2016. So as an overview, we put together a mind map, um, which uh, you can find on, um, on, on the uh, symposium's website, um, we've posted this up. Um, and the kind of recommendation we're making here is the importance of, of using networks in support of group work that is multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary, which is very much what the water sector is about. And the IHE provided us with that common understanding of water and environmental issues um, that allowed us to carry out our activities and also to pass that on in building the capacity of earlier career scientists that we work with. So some conclusions which you can look as, as recommendations for networking um, uh, as part of capacity building. Our network uh, formulation uh, uh, formation derived from those common experiences at the IHE in Delft these were knowledge, training, and cultural familiarities that we, that we acquired. And this has led to successful research and academic collaborations amongst ourselves and with our colleagues in the wider water sector. Uh, sorry, there's, things are jumping around on me here. Um, we continue, as you saw in the, one of the earliest slides, we continue in our network almost 40 years on. We continue to have interactions and um, and this has enhanced our past and our ongoing academic, professional, and scientific capacity of, of all of us, but also, as I mentioned, to persons with whom we work and any students we might have. And this has encompassed career choices, our choice and our uh, progression in academic careers, our career advancement, which is a euphemism for, um, for getting promotions in your job, um, some of the skills that I acquired are certainly responsible for um, some career advancement I've had. And it's also um, facilitated interinstitutional linkages and uh, for some of us has led to university faculties positions, which has resulted in many of our uh, network members holding national and international functions, whether they be public or, or, or um, academic in water resource management and impact uh, mitigation. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I leave you with um, a couple of images. Uh, with 
one of them is uh, after 20 years, our reunion at one of our favorite places for meeting up after classes had finished at the IAG, at the, the Klump, just around the corner from the IAG. And finally, I would like to dedicate this talk in memory of our uh, long-term supporter and, and lecturer at the IHE, uh, Hubert Meisters, who unfortunately passed away um, uh, just about two years ago. Gordon, thanks very much. That was a, a very nice presentation. Uh, I can tell you for many of us working in, in capacity development and uh, in higher education, it's really inspiring to see uh, the the level of um, continuation and commitment and um, interaction both on, on on the human dimension and also on the on the professional and scientific dimension that you have um, shown. So so uh, I can see um, how much this uh, this touches you on on a personal level to you and to your uh, your fellow um, colleagues, the 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 alumni. Uh, I think it, it's it's very valuable that you have shared this, and um, so it's not not only in terms of uh, knowledge and content, but it's also in terms of of the personal level and the the, the relationship and the value of mentoring and and the professors. So um, I think we can already take a lot from that. Um, as you can suspect, I have a, qu a couple of questions, but first I'm going to read a question from Lim. And meanwhile, I invite uh, the other participants, if they want to share any comment or, or question on, on the chat window, I will uh, read it out loud to, to share with all and to ask uh, Gordon to, to respond. So uh, Gordon, the, the first uh, question from Lim, uh, he says, uh, your networking is mostly among uh, academicians uh, scientists and um, researchers, to what extent are your networks, knowledge and exchanges shared with water practitioners such as consultants and water operators? Uh, Gordon, you're muted. There you are. Yeah. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, actually, our um, could you finish the last part of that sentence? I got a little yeah, bit. It says, uh, to, to what extent are your networks, knowledge, and exchanges shared with water practitioners, such as consultants and water operators, beyond um, scientists and, and researchers? Uh, actually, our network, although it might have given the impression that we were all um, academics and so on, in fact, um, Radha. Uh, is a uh, chemical engineer. Uh, she worked in uh, that area for most of her career uh, prior to joining the European Bank for Reconstruction, where she was um, assessing projects in the reconstruction of, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so very much on the, the practical scale. Um, other colleagues in, in, in India were, were working very much um, at the institutional level. Uh, one of our colleagues um, uh, uh, from Jamaica, Connie, was working for various um, companies as a consultant. Um, the most recent one was the, um, I think it's called the uh, Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica. Um, and myself, for example, even though I'm an academic, uh, when I joined the University of Hertfordshire, um, one of my closest collaborators from the very beginning until this day is a private uh, uh, fisheries consultant. Um, if you want to catch a particular kind of freshwater fish in England for a study, he's the man to get because he knows how to do it. So um, academics are not separated necessarily from um, the other practitioners, if you will. We work closely with the uh, environment agency my colleagues in, in the team that I'm in uh, work with uh, salmon and trout, and they work very closely with the Environment Agency. Myself, um, I was working uh, on a long-term project that ended a few years ago. It was about seven years project of looking at a small stream uh, not far from where I live, um, before and after they were doing some restoration work on that stream. And that was um, working very closely with the local environment agency 
um, practitioners who were out doing the, the sampling and we were processing the fish when they brought them in and making the measurements in order to make our academic study that was in support of this practical uh, uh, in the field um, restoration project to enhance that small river system. Thanks, Gordon, very much. Uh, there are more questions, but I, I will keep them for later for the second part of the of the session. But uh, I can tell you already in in advance. Uh, so Andrea is is telling you, well, it's impressive how you have kept in touch over the years. And what's your advice? What uh, what advice would you have for young professionals when it comes to building networks and maintaining relationships over time? And um, I, I, I should add that uh, nowadays with, with technologies as the platform that we are using and, and the new normal, which we will see um, soon after COVID and, and with virtual work and all the tools with which are emerging, how do you see that those, those tools and, and the young people should keep in mind to, um, to foster this kind of um, collaborations as, as you have done? But Please keep, uh, let's keep that on the side and we can come back to that uh, in a while. Uh, I want to move now to the third uh, presentation in this first uh, block of the session today. And um, we will see this, this has been uh, recorded. Uh, it's a presentation by Indica Guna Guardana and Florencia Rieiro. They are both um, colleagues at uh, Cabinet UNDP. Cabinet is um, UNDP's uh, global network for capacity development on sustainable water management. And uh, both uh, Indica and, and Florencia, they have combined skills in the water and sanitation, uh, monitoring and, and as capacity development um, analysts. So um, let's, uh, Patricio, whenever you're ready, we can, we can see this presentation, please. And capacity development. And we have our other contributors, Yasmina Raisa Penny and Bucky. Everyone. Good day, everyone. My name is Indika Gunwardena. And my name is Florencia Rieiro. Welcome to our presentation on fostering partnerships for greater impact. And this is based on CapNet experiences on water knowledge and capacity development. And we have our other contributors, Yasmina Raisa Penny and Bucky Temba Gumbo. Just to introduce about CapNet. CapNet is the international network for capacity development in sustainable water management which strategically well positioned under the UNDP's Global Water and Ocean Governance Program and implemented by Global Water Partnership Organization in Stockholm. So I, sh I must say, networks and partnerships are the backbone of CapNet. So let's go into our presentation uh, overview. Great. We will minimize our screens just to make it clearer for you to just so you can read our slides. Okay. Great. Yes. So there, uh, Florencia will take you through methodology and brief overview of the findings from literature. And then I will explain about cabinet partnerships in depth. And then Florencia again will lead you to best practices we found from the networks and the key challenges and solutions. And then we will jump into the conclusion. Great. Thank yes. you, Indika, for that. So just to start with, as Indika was mentioning, I will introduce the methodology that we use for our study. First, we, conduct, we conducted a detailed desk review of published and gray literature, uh, including CapNet internal documents, just to learn further about partnerships and different types of partnerships. Second, we conducted one-on-one uh, -on -one semi-structured interviews with 
uh, CapNet 22 active regional and country networks, and this was preceded by structured questionnaires, which guided the interviews. And thirdly, we developed a partnership tracking template to collect qualitative data on type of partnerships, institutional, thematic, and boundary levels of those partnerships, as well as best practices, challenges, and lessons learned from the networks on building, uh, strengthening, and fostering partnerships over time. Let's move to the literature findings. So based on our desk review, we, uh, we found out that partnerships can involve different levels of formality and commitments. Starting from the quite loose and informal networking at the bottom of the partnership spectrum to working arrangements based on formal agreements and organizational structures at the very top. The literature presents different levels of partnerships and they happen in different contexts. However, all share common threats. Networking, collaboration, coordination, coalition, cooperation, alliances, and formal integration were partnership levels that were mentioned by most, mostly all of the authors that we consulted. Furthermore, according to the literature, the best practices to sustain partnerships over time are related to seven key topics. Enhanced commitments, mutual trust, equal ownership, bottom-up over top-down approaches, clear communication, joint planning, and a shared vision. Based on the findings from the literature, we developed uh, the CapNet Partnership Ladder, which is the one that you can see on my slide and has four steps. The first step at the bottom is the communication level of partnership, in which there is a minimal level of trust and willingness to share information between partners. Contacts are usually made informally, person to person, rather than organization to organization. Moving one step forward, we reach to the coordination level of partnership, in which there are different ways of working towards networking behaviors. Coordination can help to address problems of fragmentation, overlap, and duplication of services. Moving one step forward, up, we have the cooperation level, in which organizations might share resources, including funds, staffing, and infrastructure. There isn't a really shared vision, but organizations support each other to achieve their own targets. And lastly, at the top of our ladder, we reach to the collaboration level, in which each organization helps their partners to become better at what they do. So both of them can benefit. Collective activity works for one same goal. So now I just will leave it to Indica to explain uh, more in detail about CapNet partnerships. Great. Uh, great, thanks, Florencia. So we're going to talk about CapNet partnerships, uh, which types of institutions the CapNet networks partnered with, and depth of partnerships, and various boundary levels, and so on. So let's look at first uh, the, just the numbers. Um, in a year, CapNet reaches around 2,000 individuals delivering knowledge through online and face-to-face -face capacity development activities. As of the most recent data, CapNet and the networks has maintained partnerships with more than 200 organizations. And uh, we have 22 active networks at the moment. Uh, we have 23, but most active networks 22 at the moment. And then uh, I can say these partnerships stretch from global to local level. Um, and let's go into the, let's look at the, the uh, diversity of the partnerships. Um, it, the when we look at the institutional category of networks partners, we can see the public sector, uh, the, the, the majority comes from the public sector and then non-governmental, 
semi-governmental and the list goes on and we can see that we have we still have to expand into the like private sector partnerships and maybe with multilateral organizations and then i must also emphasize this these are the, the evaluation of partnerships uh, of cabinet networks not at the not, not counting the the partnerships at the global secretariat level with the international organization for example and when we further um, uh, further look into the uh, the further category Good day, everyone. My name is Indika Gunder, and we can see the cabinet networks show a higher number of partnerships at national level, followed by regional and rural basin levels. It shows a good I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but there are Okay, I'm still here. So um, let's see if we bring Patricio back and um, get to the point where the video was. If not, don't worry, because we have lots of uh, questions to start. Uh, discussing and, and sharing some more content on, on partnership. So let's hold on a minute. Okay, I, I will, let's see what happens. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm getting a message from Patricia. Okay. Um, Patricia told me there is a problem with the video. Just to check, uh, Andrea and Gordon, can you um, listen to me properly? I want to know if I'm talking on my own. Okay, that's good. Uh, good. Then I assume everybody's still there. So yeah. let's just um, move ahead. And uh, if we get the video in place again, we can get back to it. And if not, we move into um, the idea of having a, a conversation amongst uh, Andrea, Gordon, uh, I will take part two and, and participants uh, sharing questions. And you are welcome also to um, share your experiences and thoughts on, on, on the chat window. So we will have three moments now to talk about different aspects of, of partnership. In moment one, basically the idea is to talk about um, what makes partnerships work. We can talk about this from different levels, from uh, WAP, from alumni network, from um, partnerships of capacity development and knowledge organizations as, as CAPNETs uh, does. More in detail, what are the incentives of partnerships? And uh, I was thinking while we were seeing, as, uh, as we could, the video by Indica and Florencia, and it's nice to share with you, Cabinet resulted as one of the recommendations from the IHE symposium uh, from 1996. So this is the value, uh, the same, Andrea, when I asked you uh, a while ago, if you could put a recommendation for the Delft agenda, really this IHE symposiums, they, they, they do play a relevant role. They give very concrete recommendations and, and, and strong things can, uh, can result from this. Cabinet, it's a very concrete experience of this. So, Finally, what can we do to assist 
institutions and professionals who want to either start a partnership or who want to strengthen a partnership. So, um, Gordon, let me hear from you first. Uh, what can you suggest? Uh, you have uh, a very nice and active experience. So what would you suggest for others who want to sort of follow your, your lead? Uh, well, <clears throat> this follows on from Andrea's question about um, maintaining, uh, developing and maintaining networks, um, especially over a period of time. Uh, ours has been 40 years. Now, when we... Um, when we uh, finished our course in 1981, you had the Apple II was the first desktop computer. There was no internet. Everything was done on the mainframe. So we didn't have this facility that we have now to speak to each other uh, over the internet. Uh, you had telephone calls or um, uh, letters by post, air mail, right? Um, and so, the important issue is to uh, keep in touch with people, but if you've lost touch with them, don't be afraid to get back in touch, even if it's been a, a fair amount of time. Um, <clears throat> you also need to be willing to reach out to people um, whom you've never met. Um, in the past, you really needed to meet someone physically. Um, <clears throat> That said, um, I, I did make contacts during my um, PhD with, with people through uh, letters by post. Um, but you need to be willing to reach out to them um, if they're working in your area and, uh, and, and see what's possible to, um, to, to find this common ground for collaborations. Um, one of the things that's worked well um, is where you see an opportunity for someone that you know who could contribute in some way to something you're doing. Um, and you have to be a bit selfless about this and just invite them in. Um, and then it'll be a kind of tit for tat situation where the next time they have something going, some project that, uh, uh, that you could contribute to, then the likelihood is that they're going to um, invite you to join them in and, uh, and, and help them with that. And if you contact someone and you're looking for something and they, they don't happen to, to, to actually be working in that area, you can maybe ask um, if they know someone who's working in that area. Sometimes a secondary recommendation will help in, in building up the network. Um, <clears throat> But for maintaining it, it's, a, 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 like I said, important not to be afraid to get back in touch if you haven't been communicating with them recently, um, because it might just be the right time for them when they're looking for some collaborative work. Now, some of us uh, older folks will have had some bad experiences where we have um, been um, open with uh, external persons for uh, collaborating and then find that we've been exploited by them. Um, and this, this is the downside, but um, it, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of benefits that you can um, reap from uh, being sufficiently open um, and inviting people in to, to collaborate and, and to discuss. So it's, um, it's a kind of a dynamic, um, perhaps difficult to explain exactly how it works, but um, <clears throat> uh, currently, uh, for example, um, I'm working with a former postdoc of mine. Um, after some years of postdocs and postdocs, we finally got him a, a permanent position at the university in Poland. And the work we're doing together has been made available. Uh, uh, it's a decision support tool for um, identifying potentially invasive aquatic species. And uh, we get contacted by people and they invite us to, to join in because they would like to do what we've done, but maybe it's a little bit complicated and it kind of snowballs. And so um, I'm actually kind of a, a, a mentor for um, some early career folks in China, in the Philippines, 
in uh, various countries where um, one of the recent papers we had to come out is from a, a early career scientist in, in uh, Russia, in Siberia. Um, another one is a paper submitted with someone who's from, from Iran. So um, it, it, it's a question of, of being open and being uh, sensitive to other people's time zones, their cultural things, uh, their cultural habits and so on. But um, it's just a question, I, I think, of, of putting yourself out there sufficiently to be welcoming um, at the same time being sufficiently cautious that you don't find that your ideas are being run away with, which can happen, unfortunately, because there are a few sharks out there. Um, <clears throat> even in academia, you would think, oh, that's commercial, that's corporate. But in fact, there are some scientists out there who are as aggressive as some of your corporate types. Um, you know, uh, what do they call it? Wolf of Wall Street type scientists. And they exist. And I, I've encountered them myself. So um, I can speak from experience. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I think it's very positive that that you refer to these issues. Um, so 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 honestly, as uh, they do happen, but I, I think you have been very clear and, and fair enough to say that it's only a, a minor sort of isolated situations, and that uh, they they shouldn't prevent for us to, as you said, to being open and and to putting ourselves out there and and go there. Um, in, in my own experience, also having worked with uh, with Capnet in basically in an open global partnership, I've, I've been working here for um, more than 17 years now, and I've been working with uh, in in many many courses and development uh, of activities, meetings, and manual at least with with 100 partners. And in in these 17 years, I only had one bad experience where, where, where I could say, well, you know, I, I don't want to work again with, with these people. And that was just one in, in, in 100 or more in 17 years. So um, it, it does happen. We, we, need to, we need to learn. But the, the, the glass is always uh, half uh, full. That's, that's for sure. Um, we have a couple of questions. One about uh, overcoming yeah. language barriers. And yeah. another one about building interpersonal relationships and trust amongst uh, partners. Um, if we deal with that one, first of all, uh, I have a very recent experience. Um, a young researcher, um, uh, well, early career researcher who's based in Texas, uh, contacted me about our, our, uh, the work we're doing with my, my colleague, uh, my Italian colleague in Poland, uh, former postdoc. And um, she we agreed that we would Skype. And in the first instance, she said, I, I just want to Skype because I want to get to know you. And it turns out that even though she was early career, she had already experienced such a, an exploitative arrange, a situation that she realized it's important to develop those interpersonal relationships um, before embarking upon, uh, you know, a bit further into the collaborative side. And, and this is one of the benefits of Skype or um, uh, Zoom or whichever, uh, you know, WhatsApp, whatever you use, because there's something in the, um, the, the, the body language and so on that you can tell about people um, that you don't get from emails, which are very impersonal. Um, if we go back to the, the question about language barriers, um, in fact, we have a paper that we just submitted to the um, a journal called Applied Linguistics. And in this paper, um, which has about 70 or 80 co-authors, these are all the people involved in taking our uh, screening tool that we use for identifying uh, potentially invasive aquatic species. And this has been translated into uh, 32, 33 languages. So when you open the program, it's in Excel. Uh, you can choose which language that you want to, you know, in, the languages are like uh, Mandarin, Filipino, uh, Urudu, um, you know, Polish, Italian, English, French, German, uh, all kinds. It, it covers something, some, something like 80% of the countries in the world has a national language that, that you can use um, to, to use this, this toolkit. 
And in our paper, what we talk about is the conflict between two opposing paradigms, the diffusion of English paradigm, which is being driven by journal impact factors and so on that, you know, English language is being pushed uh, to all the countries around the world. And the opposing one is called the ecology of languages. And this is the paradigm that promotes um, your own native languages, local dialects, and so on. And we had to deal with some of these issues because we had um, colleagues who are from Mexico who are speaking Mexicano uh, of a form of Spanish. And then the, uh, you have the colleagues in Spain who speak uh, Castellano. So um, they had to come to agreement about how they would proceed with this. Whereas with the Portuguese, there is a, um, an agreement that exists between the Portuguese speaking countries. Um, it, I think it's called the uh, autograph agreement, something like that. And it's a kind of an agreement between the Portuguese speaking countries of, of, um, uh, of what would be the standard international form of Portuguese. So um, language is, is unfortunately for non-native English speakers, English is the, 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 the kind of the dominant language in science these days. But um, when you're speaking and trying to communicate to stakeholders, they won't necessarily have English as their native language. And even the assessors who are assessing things in their own country, they will be accessing documents that are in their native language or another language they might speak. And they're having to translate that into English if your decision support tool is only in English. And so you introduce linguistic uncertainty and there are some distinct differences in the interpretation of terms. Even, even within English, a lot of people can't agree what does invasive mean, you know? So um, the, in order to, to resolve this issue of linguistic uncertainty, um, our decision support tool allows the assessor to use their native language. And then the report of the screening assessment that's taken place is output in their language because they have responded in their native language and they can then provide the report on each species in the native language to their stakeholders who then can read it in their own language and not have to try and struggle with, with English. So maybe okay. I'm kind of diverting a little bit away from the language question, but, but this is how we're interfacing between um, uh, academic academics, which is driven by English, and practitioners who are in the, the bridge between the two, and then the stakeholders who are on the other side of the, the gap between English and, and uh, you know, the end user, if you will. No, it's, it's great. And uh, now I want to pick it up from there. And um, first, I'd like to invite all participants to, uh, I guess you're all following it, but there are interesting things being shared on, on, on the chat window. So please keep an eye on, on the side and you're all welcome to, to participate and to add your, your contributions. Um, but now I want to pick it up where you left it, um, Gordon, with the matter of uh, language and ask uh, Andrea to share her experience on, on the, uh, the collaboration between uh, the Netherlands, Malawi, uh, this um, um, Netherlands, of course, I, I, I wouldn't uh, assume they, they were speaking Dutch in, in Malawi, so to start with, uh, they, they were using their, their second language, English. And how did that work in, in Malawi? And also, how did it feel from your end uh, as, as a researcher? And uh, all this sort of uh, communication, um, culture, sensibilities, and trust building. What, what has been your experience? Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, language... Language is a huge, um, a huge issue, I guess, also in terms of like the nuances of languages that can sometimes get lost if you don't speak your native language and um, if you switch to um, a second language. Um, in, in the case of the Netherlands and Malawi, it worked surprisingly well in terms of communicating in English. So I did not observe any um, um, significant language barriers when it came to sort of the, um, the technical um, cooperation side of things. Um, but in terms of culture, 
Um, I was often told by um, even the, the Dutch team um, themselves that the Dutch have a reputation of being very direct and like very to the point. Um, and sort of they, they were joking even themselves about the stereotype and how this sometimes sort of um, did not exactly align with the Malawian way of um, communicating. And of course, these are stereotypes and there are, of course, lots of um, you know, nuances and differences in terms of how individuals communicate. Um, but sort of the stereotypical way of the Dutch is being like very direct and the stereotypical way of like the Malawian side in terms of communicating is being um, very attentive to relationships and maintaining harmony between um, in communication. So that apparently sometimes caused some, um, at, um, you know, uh, question marks um, or sort of um, hiccups in the relationship. Um, so that was a thing. Um, in terms of sort of um, building partnerships and, and, and using virtual means of communication, I do think that um, sort of these virtual means that we are like all now getting more and more familiar with, they have a lot of value in partnerships, um, but the face-to-face -face component is also um, important. That's what I sort of experienced on the ground and what I was often told by partners that this sort of opportunity to come together and go to the field together and look at different examples um, on site, like on the ground, like how are you dealing with your um, non-revenue water? How are you dealing with your pro-poor um, approaches in terms of serving low-income communities? That sometimes created um, a lot of connection and helped um, building these relationships. And then I do think um, it's, it's then perhaps like more valuable to follow up later virtually, um, but, but still have this face-to-face -face component if possible to really get um, this like on-site um, experience. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, and this gives me the, the opportunity to move into the second um, discussion moment, which has um, its focus on the generation and facilitation of uh, knowledge sharing and, and knowledge creation and um, of course I, I do agree with you that face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meetings and face-to-face -face activities and, and field work is irreplaceable in, in many many levels um, so hopefully we will also get back soon to, to that possibility in, in the world but uh, further to that we will see more and more changes in terms of, of technologies. Uh, also, Gordon mentioned them, like uh, how much easier it is nowadays to keep in touch with uh, an alumni group on um, WhatsApp, on, on, on the phone, on, on so many more tools. Uh, so in, in terms of creating knowledge together, I, I, I think uh, Gordon has shared a lot about that. But but still, if if you both were going to to make uh, one or two very concrete recommendations for actions, and by actions I mean which are the 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 strategies or the activities which institutions, perhaps as IHE could follow, or as a global programs which are part of the UN as CapNet could do, to uh, facilitate that. Uh, practitioners, academics, and scientists uh, work together to both create knowledge and then to share that knowledge. So what would be the concrete things which, which could be done and which we are not doing, or perhaps which we're not doing to all its possible extent? You want to start this time, Andrea, and then we, we give it to, to Gordon to, to close this part? Sounds good. Okay. Um... So I guess I sort of two main recommendations for action, um, building on my what I sort of mentioned earlier. Um, one thing um, that I really think is important to keep in mind is the need for time and patience in partnerships. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of, um, Damien, as you mentioned, also we're all looking for the measurable indicators. We all want to see results. We all want to see like how, what did this actually do on this partnership? Did it actually you know, get us ahead, were there actually, was there actually any progress and we want to have like measurable results. Um, but on the other, like I want to sort of caution a little bit and say, you know, we also need to keep in mind that building relationships takes time. And especially if sort of partners are expected to innovate, then 
maybe that takes even more time in terms of some things might work and some things might not work. There's just like an open-ended part to a relationship or like a partnership too. And I think we need to keep that in mind when we are all talking about finding indicators for measuring um, these partnerships. Um, and sort of in terms of the, the specific frameworks we're using, um, I, I mentioned this in the presentation and I shared a link to the article. Um, there is a great article out there that has been published in 2013 um, that sort of suggests such an, um, a framework that also takes um, into account sort of these intangible relational um, um, benefits or re results um, and sort of allows for this progression over time. Um, but I do think, and also what Gordon mentioned, maybe there is an opportunity for more collaborative research um, on such alternative evaluation frameworks that could build on this earlier um, article, um, sort of to take more recent experiences into account. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, we, we didn't get the chance to hear all of the presentation on CupNet, but um, I was wondering maybe, Damian, if you have worked with uh, GWOPA, sort of this, uh, this WAP, Global WAP Alliance, um, and if you have worked with water operators in terms of facilitating trainings um, between them. So I would say perhaps like looking at potential synergies also between sort of UN um, initiatives and UN organizations, um, sort of in terms of working together in offering these trainings? Yes, thank you. We, we did. Uh, we did some work in the past with uh, WAP, also with uh, at, at some point with um, water safety plans. And uh, uh, although our focus is more on the governance aspects and, and water management, IWRM, that kind of thing, not so much into water and sanitation. We always keep an eye on, on water and sanitation and, and we're always uh, sort of um, evaluating uh, possible activities. We are now entering a, a very active program this year working on uh, ISO 30,500 and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and also with uh, IWA. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I, I just think we, we didn't do much because of our own limitations and, and, and capacity. But, uh, but yeah, there, there has been, uh, and uh, we had some contact also with the Maria Pascual. So um, yeah, it, it, it all sounds in, in, in the framework. So yes, the, there are collaboration and, uh, and we can also follow if you want on that, on that line. Um, so it's, uh, here I have my colleague Jasmina telling me it's ISO 30,500 and ISO 24,151. We will do a lot of uh, capacity development to train people you know, on the implementation of those uh, with ANSI. That's uh, our partner, which is the, uh, Jasmina, can you tell me the complete name? It's the American National uh, Something Institute, I think. I will tell you in a moment. Great. Um, and Patricio is telling me that Indica San Florencia's video, which we couldn't see completely, is uploaded in the handouts. So you can you can go afterward and, and see it there. Um, okay. Gordon, do you want to um, add anything to, to this line on sharing it? Sorry, ANSI, it's the American National Standard Institute. That's our partner. In, in the work we are starting now. Um, Gordon, I'll give you the word now to continue this uh, talk about knowledge um, creation and sharing, please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'd like to follow on from, uh, or pick up on something that Andrea mentioned, and, and that is that, that the development of partnerships and networks um, takes time. Now, um, you're asking the recommendations for the IHE. Well, you know, I, I, I attended 39 years ago, so I, I, I can't really speak about what's happening at the IHE now. Um, in fact, as far as I understand, our course, the Environmental Science and Technology course, is not even offered anymore. Um, <clears throat> I might be wrong, but uh, I heard something of that. Um, at that time, there, was, there, were, there weren't any courses that were or there wasn't any instruction about um, network building, 
partnership building, capacity building as part of the course. All right. <clears throat> um, it was a very unique kind of course because you could come from any scientific background, engineering, natural sciences, and, and, and take the course. Um, and then you would learn about other people's disciplines. Um, but there wasn't anything that was about how to make use of this wider knowledge and, and uh, develop uh, partnerships and networking. Um, if they still don't have that, then my recommendation would be that they look at the possibility of having um, some sort of tutorial session or something where they, um, they, they maybe use some kind of group work um, to help participants um, appreciate the importance of communication and networking and so on. Um, <clears throat> because uh, Gordon was just about to give us his secret and he was frozen in the because. Maybe so, I can um, jump in here uh, real yeah, quick. Uh, if you know the answer, please do. No, because you all unfortunately, want to know. Um, but okay. maybe I can. I just wanted to add something um, to what what Gordon um, said. Um, there are now. Um, so I I participated back in 2018. I participated in a short course at the IHE. Um, so um, it seems like the the course that Gordon attended is no longer offered. But the IHE does offer short courses um, that take about. You know, in my case, it took three weeks. And it was also really a really great opportunity to get to know um, students at the IIG and others, professionals that were joining. So there are um, perhaps options now following on to Gordon's course. Yeah, sorry, the, um, the Chrome froze on me. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the, the, the point I was trying to make is that um, uh, as part of our course, um, our year class there were three of us that we called ourselves the three musketeers we started organizing out of class meetups like parties and so on you saw us at the pub uh, uh, the grump um, this was something that we did on our own back but we also benefited from um one of our colleagues uh, jacob i mentioned who who passed away um in a flood in ghana some years ago um, he, nobody in the in the class would have passed um, biological and chemical engineering if it weren't for the tutorials that Jacob led. And it was these interactions between classmates and then the outside of class activities where we would organize a party. And in doing so, you had to pay attention to what kind of food you were offering because people have different dietary um, um, limitations or, or um, preferences linked to their uh, cultural and religious backgrounds. And all of that part of learning experience brought us together. And a few years after we had finished, we, you know, speaking to Hubert <clears throat> uh, Maesters, we said, you know, Hubert, you know, we have a kind of a special year class. And he said, no, no, it's not, not very special. And then after six, seven, 10 years went by, he started to admit that, in fact, we were a little bit unique because the other year classes would keep in touch for one or two years and then they would lose touch. Um, and then after 20 years and the reunion came back and he had to admit, yes, you're absolutely a unique year um, compared to other ones that he'd seen. But why were we unique? Was it the composition of our class or was it something that we brought to um, to the course that we communicated subconsciously or unconsciously to everyone else about integrating and getting to know each other and so on? Now, it's obvious that you will never get along with everyone. And there were more, um, let's be politically correct here, older persons, older participants who brought their families and so on. And so they would never participate in these parties. Um, and then you had other people who, for some other reason, religious or other, um, 
decided not to attend, but the vast majority of, of, of uh, participants did, did um, participate in these, these extracurricular activities. Um, but we were all working on this in inclusivity um, within the class. And if the IHE doesn't have some kind of tutorial or some component in their courses to um, build on capacity. And I would be surprised given that the IHE is a, a big driver of the capacity building um, in, in the water sector. Um, if they don't have those in the courses, then that would be my recommendation. Um, and one of the ways of doing it is identifying key persons um, from recent and even further years and get them back to give lectures. Now, uh, it could be by video link these days. It could be video link even without corona uh, virus. Um, but you could have people come back and then interact with the classes in order to communicate to them the importance of building these links and how in the future, the relationships that they established during their one year at the IEG in Delft um, can serve them for the whole rest of their lives. My career, my salary, my existence now was so strongly influenced. Uh, uh, I wanted to learn French, the second language of Canada, but I had trouble. So I learned Dutch, uh, started learning before coming to the Netherlands. I, I was determined Dutch people like to speak English, but I was very persistent and I learned to speak Dutch when I was there. It's, it's all forgotten now mostly, but um, it, it, it changed me. It allowed me to learn French. It, it, I made friendships that I have for my whole life. Um, so, and they've in, influenced my career and so on. And I was able to build on other skills that I had, but they brought something more to it. The experience in Delft brought something more to it. And if there's any way that they can enhance that by maybe getting past people back, preferably physically. Um, I, I only live 45 minutes from Amsterdam, if you take the plane from Norwich, okay? Um, but there are other people uh, around who uh, could come either by video link or physically um, when the circumstances permit to, to communicate this, the importance of, of um, the relationships that are built and how they can uh, feed in, not only for their own careers, but for those of the persons that they mentor, either um, as part of their job responsibility, meaning academics with their students, or as line managers in a company um, whether it be a private or um, an NGO, for example, okay. when you line manage, uh, you're basically um, uh, mentoring people. Okay, thanks, Gordon. Um, we should uh, move on because we are on, on time. But uh, there is uh, one last. I, I would like to ask both of you to give just one very final remark, um, like a, a bullet point. On, on, on your final recommendation on how do we measure and understand the impact of, of partnerships? Like very concrete, a sort of a, a, a bullet point which you would like to give us to include in the, uh, in the Delft uh, agenda, which we'll elaborate. I, I would say, um that it's demonstrated not only on a personal level through your own success in your projects, but also in how that translates to uh, the improvement of the, the water environment and um, communication of the threats and the ways of mitigating impacts to uh, the water environment, um, to stakeholders and to the general public. Okay. Thank you, and Andrea. Um, I think we need to move away from only looking at quantitative key performance indicators focused on sort of operational and financial performance um, and also take um, social indicators into account um, that measure things like participation, affordability, um, access, um, and 
and really perhaps have more collaborative research on, on developing these alternative frameworks based on what's already there and what sort of more experiences are telling us. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I think you have bo both been very kind in, in sharing your views. I think we, we managed to, to gather uh, an experience from a PhD research on, a, on an active ongoing relationship at the level of, of an utility. And then on, on the other hand, this rich, really, um, continuation of an IHE alumni group from 1981 and how they managed to um, stay connected, uh, all the things that they have done together. And I think that, uh, as, as you suggested, Gordon, building skills, because in, in the end, one of the, the questions from my role in, in cabinet, I always ask this, okay, what are the skills that make that some people are pro uh, oriented towards partnership, towards collaboration, um, towards uh, leverage, like uh, I share, you share, and together we, we do more. What are those skills? And I think that this um, sort of enthusiasm in which you described this uh, this experience and this alumni group, which has almost 40 years, uh, shows that uh, definitely those uh, personal level skills have to be in place to enable the other results that you have also shown. And uh, I think that those skills on a personal level, which need to be sort of um, facilitated combined with with the ideas of thinking out of the box which Andrea is bringing and considering new framework, new alternatives and new ways also of, of measuring this and uh, moving ourselves from the um, demand and pressure on the quantitative analysis. I think it's it's uh, it's a very complete and and uh, dimensional um, roadmap. Um, it's a, a, a pity we couldn't see uh, Indica and Florencia's uh, presentation complete. Um, but uh, it, it happens, I, I think, in this uh, new normal that we are living. First of all, we were supposed to be meeting face to face today now in, in, in Delft. Uh, and probably after the session, also go to one of the of, of the bars on the corner of IHE and continue the discussion uh, over there. Uh, but uh, well, it was impossible, and we have these tools. And sometimes these tools uh, have some complications. Uh, we lose connection. Uh, the video might not work. But we go ahead. We are changing, and, and it's great that we have managed to still have the session in place. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow, track six on capacity development has three topics, as I'm sure you all know. This one is topic one on collaboration, but at the same time, there are two other sessions going on or about to finalize two on uh, methods and on community. And tomorrow, Thursday, uh, at the same time we started today, we have another session, a webinar, which will bring the conclusions and the findings from the three sessions. So I will um, copy the link here in, on the chat window. So there you can see it. It would be nice if you want to join tomorrow to see the, uh, the, this webinar, which, which will present the, the findings. And we will have also two guest uh, speakers. Uh, to continue elaborating on the topic of capacity development. Then um, all materials are there on the platform in the handout sessions. Uh, this recording, I guess, will be available too. So with this, I'd like to thank you all very much. Thanks especially Andrea, Gordon, Indica, and Florencia for your availability, your, your trust to be here. Thank you, Patricio and Jasmina, also for your help in this session. I hope you find uh, good uh, value here, and, and especially that we will pick up good recommendations for the Delft agenda, and uh, that uh, your input today will help us continue the way forward in the coming years in, in building partnerships and capacity development. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, wherever you are, and uh, thanks again, and we'll keep in touch.
Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.